Take it away, Bill. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay, yep. great. Well, um, one of the things, let's see. Uh, first, uh, special thanks to both Newland and Will. And, uh, you know, if not for Newland, I wouldn't be here. He contacted me uh, just a few days ago, said, hey, can you, can you be involved with this? I said, yes, I'd love to. And Will has just been great, helped me get set up and get the tech going and everything, getting all these media files that you're going to be watching cached. So definitely thanks to those two. Another thing is I uh, always practice my presentations to get the timing right. And so uh, one of the things I'd like to ask is that everybody hold their questions, possibly mute their microphones in that way. Uh, I'll just get through this thing as quickly as possible. We'll get all the questions done at the end. Maybe make yourself a little note if you want to ask something. And now on to a serious topic. First, the bad news. Uh, there's uh, bad news and good news. Uh, the bad news is that we have a media that wants to scare the hell out of us and give us only the bad news. Uh, it is an in-your-face news, what I call crisis news network. Um, and so uh, this is the bad news and we're only gonna hear the bad news, but I'm here to tell you that there's some good news too. Because after all, if, uh, if, if you're only paying attention to the bad news, um, how the hell is Pangolin in business? How the hell is anyone else gonna be in business, right? So uh, there's gotta be some good news out there and I'm happy to share the, the good news where, where there is good news. So, so here's the serious situation, um, how the industry is doing. Well, for one thing, uh, live events such as concerts have been hit really hard. Uh, and I think that that bears repeating. Uh, you know, concerts themselves have been hit hard and the live events. Uh, so the question, you know, I'm in a lot of business groups and they're using the word pivot right now and that's a word that I really don't like because it means that uh, at least implies you stop doing one thing and start doing another but the fact of the matter is that uh, you know when the um, you know when, when crisis hits the large lumbering dinosaur companies tend to go out of business while the small furry little creatures tend to adapt and survive so uh, so that's what's happening really uh, that there are new applications emerging I've got a picture here showing a drive-in movie theater and so people have actually started doing drive-in laser shows. Uh, so that's one of the things that they've found, the small furry little creatures. Another thing is the existing applications that have been here for a really long time, but we have never really been fully exploited, such as, uh, for example, laser advertising and digital signage. These are ideas that have been around for a long time, but when the streets are lined with gold and you can do rock concerts and make hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars profit, you tend to not go after these things, but uh, now that rock concerts, things like that aren't happening, at least live, um, people are starting to push on digital signage and uh, having some success in there. And architectural lighting, such as laser mapping and that sort of thing, is taking place, right? And so what I'm saying is that people have found new ways of, you know, there's a, there's a book called Who Moved My Cheese? It's a business book. Uh, people have, are finding new cheese. Uh, in that light, we encourage everyone to get out there and show what lasers can do. Explore new ideas, explore new ways that lasers can be used and promote this stuff, show off the technology and because that really helps everybody. Um, all right, so how is Pangolin doing? You know, we, we talked about how the industry is doing, how is Pangolin doing? Well, uh, what I, I use the word maintaining. We've been able to maintain our business. Uh, partially because we are a diversified company. We have uh, several divisions. You know, we have Pangolin Laser Systems that deals with laser systems and software. We have Laser, the semiconductor product, which I was very happy to see being used on David Kumpel's projectors, been used by a lot of things. And we continue to make sales of Laser, including in the China. And obviously, we've got the Scanner Max Division 2. We're going to be talking about that here a little bit. And we've actually uh, started a couple of other divisions ourselves, I'll, and I'll, I'll mention that very briefly. So how is Pangolin doing? Well, uh, one of the things that we've done is we have retained our entire full-time staff with full-time employment uh, status. Uh, and I've done that on principle. You know, Justin and I both know people, friends who have been completely fired, let go as soon as this COVID thing, this, the hint of it, it looked like it was gonna hit, people got fired. I, I know of a, a large company in the photonics business that has laid off 50% of their staff and 100% of their engineering staff, which was un un unbelievable to me. But uh, on principle, I'm a principled guy. Uh, I think corporate America has done a terrible job for all, all the people out there for, you know, it's like when the going got tough, the tough got going and fired everyone. I, that, so that's something that I, I, I just won't do. I refuse to do that. My philosophy 
is that life works when you work. And my life was going to continue to work. And I wanted for everyone who works with me, their life to work too. And so we have retained everybody at their, at their full staff. We haven't cut pay. We haven't cut hours. We haven't cut anything. Uh, so because of that, the net result of that is that we have built up a huge stock of scanners. We have continued to build scanners, <laughs> even though the customers have kind of declined at least for a brief time. Um, and so because of that, you know, we're willing to make some deals. I'll talk about that here in a second. You know, so how is Pangolin doing? In addition to that, we're investing. Uh, we have uh, bought the building right next door to us. And so we have turned that into a 4,500 square foot studio. And it's great. We call it Lyra's Lair. And it has, uh, on, from time to time, as much as 25 lasers on that rack. And it is huge. You might see the balls there that you got some of the pictures. And these are just a few pictures. It actually looks like a club. I call it, I, I jokingly refer to it as Club Pango. We've got um, you know, full multimedia setup, including PCs, lighting consoles, grandma, grand MA, Apple lights, all kinds of stuff. Things I don't even know because that's lighting is not my kind of a gig. Uh, repair and technical area. And so, uh, so at this place, we can have people come over. We could do training sessions and stuff like that. And there's actually movies that are being done, theatrical movies in Sanford, Florida, where we're located. And we had a person come over and say, hey, wow, this would be a great place to have uh, some movie stu stuff. So, uh, so that's one of the things we're doing. So that's how Pangolin is doing. So what is Pangolin doing? Um, so uh, one of the things we've been doing over the past uh, year is preparing for BeamBrush hardware for broad release. Uh, you've been seeing kind of bits and pieces. People are using this thing. And so it, it is in existence right now. We're preparing for broad release. We're also preparing 5.0 for broad release. I'm only gonna be talking about two things about uh, beyond 5.0 uh, in this presentation. One of them is the new licensing system. So up until now, um, if you buy beyond, it's locked to a particular piece of hardware. And oftentimes, or some, sometimes people need to move that hardware along, a piece of hardware gets lost or gets stolen or something of that nature, and what do you do? And, and so one of the things that we're concentrating on with this new licensing system is being able to uh, move that license from one piece of hardware to another. Uh, the new licensing system gives us the ability to do what we call rentals. So for example, if you needed to rent a, a Beyond Ultimate system for a weekend gig or something like that, this new licensing system gives us the capability of doing that. Uh, and, and also we're introducing this concept of what I call an internet license. It's sort of like how you buy Adobe and you log on to Adobe and you could use it for, for some period of time, something of that nature. So, um, so basically some, we basically getting some additional licensing options that we think are going to be more uh, convenient for uh, our clients. And uh, BeamBrush is being deployed throughout beyond and uh, everywhere we could possibly stuff BeamBrush and BeamBrush capabilities and BeamBrush effects. That is one of the things that, Beam, uh, that Beyond 5.0 is really uh, going to be working on. So, um, so another thing that we're doing here is concentrating on new program, uh, programs such as live streams, webinars, uh, just to offer continued education to our clients. You may have noticed some of this stuff. Uh, we have uh, this uh, quick hints series of videos on our YouTube channel. And uh, basically we're, we're, we're not stopping. No virus can stop us. That is my, that is my um, firm belief. Uh, and that's the basis on which we are proceeding. Uh, so how's ScannerRack's doing? Well, we're seeing growth in new market sectors. We've been able to pick up some, I call it paint removal. Sometimes people call it laser cleaning, but uh, it's these things that take old 1967 muffler uh, manifolds that you see out there in junkyards and can in a single sweep clean it and turn it into a beautiful thing. So we found a lot of business in that uh, thing. Uh, we're, like I say, we've we maintained our full staff. So we built up a huge stock of systems. And so if you're interested in buying scanners, you know, we ran a special a uh, month or two ago and Ryan was handling that. But um, even though there's no special advertise right now, if, if you're interested in scanners, basically pick up the phone, give us a call. And, you know, uh, we got lots of scanners on the, on the shelf. So, uh, so you know, we are also investing in new developments. Um, we had a customer contact us the other day and say, hey, uh, you know, I, I just uh, sold one of your systems. And when he said sold, he meant he put it into one of his systems and, and, th and they sell these systems to other customers. They said, I just sold one of your Compact 506 systems for 16 millimeters. And of course, we didn't make a 16 millimeter system. 
we stopped at 10 millimeters. And so we had to give them the bad news. We had that, you know, we only go up to 10 millimeters and they insisted we make a system with 16 millimeters. And so we did. And so you, this picture here on the right, you see, uh, on the far left, you see our little three millimeter system. A lot of you are using that system. Now the middle system, what's surprising is the middle system's eight millimeters. In this picture, it doesn't look all that much bigger than the three millimeter system, but it is huge. That's, eight, those are, that's for an eight millimeter aperture. And on the far right is what we come up with this client that's 16 millimeters. These are laser marking mirrors. It is ridiculous. It's a huge mirror on a tiny scanner. The mirror weighs half as much as the scanner, which is unprecedented, uh, but it works. And we can get 10K out of this thing. Uh, and uh, so it's pretty cool. We also have a 50 millimeter system. It's not shown here, but um, uh, it's a, we, we developed a scanner. It's the size of your fist that moves a mirror the size of your hand. Uh, and we were contacted by a theatrical lighting company that wants to move 50 millimeter light beams and do laser-like things with it. You know, it is a little bit funny to me that the, the lighting guys have been coming after us since 1992. In 1992, they came up with something called the emulator you might know about. If you don't, just poke around and say emulator lighting effect in Google and you'll see what I'm talking about. So they're coming after us. The lighting guys coming after us. They want to do laser type effects, right? So then they came out with the Sharpie. Right, so, so then more recently, they've got this thing called stylus, but it's spelled funny. It's like X-T-S-L-O-S or something like that. They're coming after us, right? So now we're coming after them. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, but, and we're just continuing to push, right? So that's what we do, we push. So beam brush, that's what we're all here really to talk about and learn about. What is beam brush? It's an optomechanical piece of hardware. You saw it very briefly in David's uh, picture uh, last time. And here in this picture, I am holding it. Uh, it's a regular XY scanner pair and this funny little thing to the left of it. Uh, and what happens is it creates this U-shaped path through there where the beam goes in. Normally where the beam would come in and hit your X scanner and go to the Y scanner. Now the beam skates just under the Y, the, the y scanner. The, the, the body of the Y scanner, it goes under the body of the Y scanner, goes through this beam shape, uh, this beam brush system, which makes a U-shaped path and then projects it onto the X mirror, then onto the Y scanner and out. And so that's how it works and not very big. So you can see it, it can generally fit, be fit into any projector where there's an XY system right now. And what beam brush does is it allows fast, precise and linear control of the beam divergence, all in real time under software control and it's super fast. Uh, and to me, I think that this is the biggest impact in laser shows since color. Uh, so now, why, why, uh, why be even interested in this? Uh, so in, we got two pictures here on the screen. The picture on the left is the very first laser projected graphic that was ever done. It was done by Jean Montague, founder of General Scanning in 1975. And it made it to the co uh, cover of Industrial Research Magazine where he was projecting on clouds. Uh, here's an inside piece of information. They couldn't really get the clouds to cooperate. So this is an artist's rendition, but nevertheless, they tried. They did it, and, and, and if the clouds would have cooperated, this is what it would have looked like. So then in 1975, that's what laser shows look like. In 2020, this is what laser shows look like on the right. And to me, it's the same damn thing. It's the same, okay, now we got color. We got a couple of more uh, lines because we got faster scanners, but it's the same thing. It's where we're all, we've been using a Sharpie all this time. And so, um, so what does beam brush do? It allows you to basically give you another dimension. It is a new dimension for laser shows. And this dimension can be used in a lot of different ways. It can be used for graphics, for beam effects, uh, and for everything. It's very excited. And uh, in a second, we're actually gonna see some videos uh, of this thing being in use. So here's some of the things, and this is really super early stuff that we've done with it and not very good pictures, but you start to see here that we, that with, with this variable divergence, we can now impart a new dimension onto this and another layer of uh, artistic thing. And like I say, once you see the, the videos, uh, these the pictures are just not very uh, impactful right now. But, uh, but yeah, it increases and decreases the divergence in real time under computer control. Uh, and it can be used in beam effects too. Some people, you know, I've been talking about beam, uh, beam brush for a really long time. And they, people who understood what I meant, understood what it would do for laser graphics. And some people really didn't understand what it could do for beams. And it could do something very dramatic for beams because we can go from this razor sharp, sharpy looking thing that we've been using for 45 years to all of a sudden blow this thing up to the size of a wash light and everything in between and have a large degree of dynamics. And we're gonna see this here in a couple of videos here. So, uh, 
So I'm going to start off by, and this is going to be in that uh, live streaming thing that uh, Will has set up for us it is, uh, with Mike Dunn's show. I've got four shows to show you, and we're not going to show you the entire show in the interest of time, but a couple of minutes of each show. Uh, I have posted in Photon Lexicon, and we'll repost a link to each one of these four videos. So on Photon Lexicon uh, sometime tomorrow, so I'm not going to introduce, uh, you know, kind of conflicting viewing uh, biases. You, you, I want everyone to concentrate on the LEM now, but once this LEM is over, I'll post on Photon Lexicon the link to the four things that you can see it again. So, so with this being said, I'll have to, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Will, who will cue this first thing, which is what we're going to see is what Mike Dunn did with, uh, with Beambrush.
All right. So uh, just uh, give me a nod to make sure that, uh, that you can hear me, that my mic's working and everything. Everything good? Okay, good. Yeah. So uh, the next one I'd like to uh, have Will assist us in showing is uh, Peter, uh, a graphic show that Peter Jean did. And this actually, this, this little picture I've got here is a picture that he has done with Beambrush. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's been great to work with Peter. I, and as you watch this show, one thing to keep in mind, this whole thing from conception to actually execution and delivery and recording was done in only four days. So uh, go ahead, Will. back on live everything working okay good so uh yeah i'll just mention too that everything you saw there uh it was uh, the phone call conversation were like this uh hey peter we got this bean brush thing you heard it yeah okay uh we'd like to have you involved in this so from that conversation to making a whole show everything you saw there was original artwork there was no reuse of things 100 percent original artwork plus the conception, plus using, and he used a, a previous version of the tools that were kind of more primitive and was able to spin that whole thing in four days. So I'm very impressed with that. Uh, so the next one is uh, a similar thing. So the conversation again went like this. We, we know these folks from Russia, they're called Dream Laser, great people. We picked up the phone and say, hey, we got this new tool you never heard of called Beanbrush. And here's some things. I sent them a video, it's a 30 minute video of me showing them kind of the mechanics. And what I mean by the mechanics of, of, of the beyond, it's like, okay, see this effect does this and this effect does this and this effect does this. So now here you use beyond this new Beanbrush thing you never seen of or heard of before. And because we would like you to make a laser show with it. And uh, two days later, they came back to with us with this. Now, in this case, it was an existing show that they had. But, um, but nevertheless, they were able to take an existing show and apply something they'd never seen of, never heard of, a, a, a quick phone call from Bill Benner, and a 30-minute introduction to, to Beyond Beanbrush Features. And this is what they were able to do. Take it away, Will. Thank you. 
All right, so uh, hope you enjoyed that. Am I looking good, um, Newland? Okay, good, good. Yeah, so uh, so now uh, one of the things I would like to em emphasize is in the case of Mike Dunn, in the case of Peter Jean, in the case of Dream Laser, they actually didn't even have a beam brush projector. All they had was Beyond and the computer screen. And they did all this stuff in the computer screen and sent us the shows and we filmed them here. So that's how, that's, that's what we did. Uh, now, this next thing is a little bit different. Uh, it's beam shows, uh, showing you what can be done with beam effects. Now, uh, the, the show I'm going to show you here was done by Lyra Letourneau, our creative director. Uh, Lyra actually did have a beam brush projector. In fact, was fortunate enough to have five beam brush projectors. And so, uh, and, and Lyra's been involved with this basically kind of sort of from the very beginning of this fifth generation development. And so Lyra has the most experience using this. And uh, so we're going to have, uh, we'll show you what Lyra can do with five beam brush projectors. And Bill, you can stop me if you want to cut it off earlier. I'm going to start this one at the beginning since it's a good spot of some of the effects. So I okay. can hear both Zoom and the show. Just let me know. Okay, great. Well, thank you.
right, so am I still on? Okay, great. Yeah, so, uh, so I hope everyone liked that. So I tell you what, my wife's been with me for 26 years. Uh, there's only two times when she cried when she saw a laser show. The first one, the first time was when she first saw the, uh, the raster show that Doug McCullough was working on. And the second time was when she saw Lyra's beam shows using beam brush. So uh, she, she saw it, she cried. And when she saw Doug McCullough's show, she said, hey, Doug, I wanted to let you know when, uh, when I saw your show, I cried. And Doug McCullough said, yeah, I did too, making it. So, uh, so that was kind of funny. So anyway, um, yep, so that's what, what's, what's going on. That's what Beambrush does. That's how it can be used. Uh, show you some of the stuff. So one of the things we're working on right now when we distribute the next version of Beyond, we'll have uh, Beambrush basically throughout. Uh, Beambrush having several Beambrush pages with graphics, with beam effects, with that sort of thing. And we have the, uh, we have the preview window. You could, you could watch this on the preview window and you could see, you could, you could be building this thing and see how it works. Um, and, and so forth. I'll show you a couple other things that we're working on here with respect to 3D. Beyond 3D, we have Beambrush stuff going into that as well. So as you can see, the working environment here where you can create things in solid models just like you, you always have been able to. Here I'm showing a cube and a cone. The cube, the, to me, the great thing about what we've done with our 3D products is that you could select each object and apply uh, effects to that specific object and apply behaviors to that specific object. So here on the cube, I said I wanted the cube to be transparent. I wanted the cube to actually have depth cubing. You can see that as the cube gets in the back, it gets dimmer. And I wanted the cube to have this beam brush effect. And yet the cone right next beside it, I said, don't have uh, depth cueing, don't have beam brush and so forth. So, so there's a tremendous degree, degree of artistic expression that you're going to be able to do with the 3D uh, tools built into Beyond. Here's another thing that shows off this. And this is only one view. This is a camera scene. It's one of our kind of famous uh, scenes where we have this camera that goes over this mountain on the top of this mountain. There's these two windmills that are flowing and there's this kind of like little little river. And so what we're seeing here in this one view, you have to use your imagination a little bit, but this river, the blue, that's the wide blue thing. The, uh, the, the grass on top of the mountain is green and that's a little bit thicker. And each one of the windmills has what we call these faded line endings. So the, the, uh, the, the blades of the windmill, it's, it's not just simple squares. It, each of the squares has this fade in, fade out effect. And all of this is 100% controllable on an object by object basis in, in the 3D program. So how do you get it? Um, the technology is being made available inside a new line of laser projectors that we uh, obviously call beam brush lasers. Uh, and we have partnered with Quant to make these things. And the reason is, is because um, we don't want to sell it as a separate little module. We have, uh, we have given these modules to several people, including Peter Jean, including David Kumpala, and a couple other folks. And um, it really requires a high degree of uh, of knowledge and precision to get it all lined up right and working right. And, and if it doesn't work right, it's going to be our problem, right? It's going to be that damn beam brush. It doesn't work. It's crappy. It's all those other things to, to avoid all the troubles that people would have and all the difficulties and all the bad press possibly out there. Remember our, my, my uh, crisis news network. Next thing we know, we'd be on crisis news network. Our pangle beam brush doesn't work, right? So, uh, so to avoid all of that, to all those troubles, we uh, are, We've chosen Quant to work with. They are integrating Beambrush into a line of their projectors. And so that's really the best way to get it. That, that projector series will have everything from three watts to 30 watts. Um, and um, the technology is available now to early adopters at a discounted price. So even though we plan on releasing it in November 2020, some people actually have Beambrush projectors in their hands right now. Uh, in fact, at the beginning of the year, it's a damn shame this COVID thing hit because at the beginning of the year, we sold a bunch of 25 watt uh, beam brush projectors and it was scheduled to go out on the largest tour of the year. It was gonna be amazing and then COVID hit. So, uh, so anyway, these things are available. They are being built and they're being av they're made available to early adopters. And again, if you want something, just pick up the phone and call us. A lot of things are not really available. Um, you know, we don't make it available on the website. We don't make a lot of stuff. Uh, um, kind of public. And so the best thing to, when you want to find out what's happening at Pangolin, the best, best thing is to do is sometimes just pick up the phone and call us. Um, so in addition to that, I talked about that we, we too are branching out a little bit. We've got uh, Pangolin, we've got uh, Lazor, we've got Scanner Max, and, and we too are, are, are expanding our business a little bit too. 
we have created an alliance actually with, uh, with Quant to create a new series of projectors that is a lower cost line, sort of like, uh, you know, I know you start with Toyota and then you go to Lexus, but we started really with Lexus and now it's really time to in, um, kind of come up with the Toyota brand. And so we, uh, the, to, to represent this alliance between Pangolin and Quant and the, the uh, kind of the coming together of the brands, we use the word unity. And so there is a new low cost line of lasers that are co-developed by Pangolin and Quant. And uh, it's intended to be a lower cost option for, for people. All of these lasers are both IEC and FDA certified, available in, in powers from 1.7 up to three watts at prices that you would not believe and higher wattage uh, systems coming soon. So we've got our raw series. This is the ones with just the ILDA input. It's kind of your simple, the reason why it's called raw is it's like uh, pretty simple, pretty basic. And, um, and another series called E-Lite that's a, a bit better uh, with both uh, FB4 integrated and, um, and um, ILDA input. So uh, like I say, just kind of, kind of some neat things going on here. And uh, so this would be a great time for questions. And that way, um, I'll, I'll answer and we'll just kind of run the clock out to the point where we all have to take another potty break and we'll turn it over to Adam Roth. Here's a quick one, uh, just about the licenses. They will migrate, right? If you have, uh, if you have a uh, beyond license on existing hardware. Oh, of course, yes, of course. You know, when we come up with 5.0, uh, we, we wouldn't want to, you know, turn off everybody else. It's just, you know, it's, it's the free updates for life model that Pangolin has just had for the last 34 years. Okay, yeah, thanks so much. Bill, do you have any uh, pricing information that you can share on these new projectors? I, you know, I, I don't. I'm, um, I'm, you know, new product development and technology, and Justin is all about the price. So um, that, that, that's that's what I say. And Justin's the deal maker, and so it's pick up the phone and call him. You know, call one eight hundred Pangolin, um, preferably Monday through Friday to get through to Justin, and um, I'm sure he'll be glad to answer the call. When do you think they'll be available? The, which, which they'll be available, the beam brush or the- uh, No, 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 the, uh, the, so the, the low cost projectors that you just talked about, the- They're, they're available right now and, and we don't have a website for that it, it, it published. The, the website is done, it's finished, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of there somewhere, let me put it that way, but as, as soon as we turn, turn it on, since it's an alliance between Pangolin and Quant, Quant is gonna have kind of their version of the website that has European stuff on it, you know, the Euro, Euro pricing and that sort of thing. Um, so the websites are, are ready. They're just being, we, we got to coordinate the turning of it on with Quant. Um, but, uh, but yeah, these things are actually being sold right now, have been sold for those people who picked up the, uh, the phone and called Justin and says, hey, I'm looking for a laser projector. You know, Justin would say, hey, well, hey, we got this new thing ready for you. Uh, it's this price. And so that, that would be a good thing to do is just call. Fair enough. If you get one of the uh, ILDA models with the DB25 in, is the beam brush exposed on like one of the other unused color inputs or is it a dedicated set of signal lines or how do you address that? That's a great question. So um, the beam brush is only gonna be available in quant projectors, not the unity projectors. So, uh, gotcha. you know, so, and then another thing is that the beam brush, one of the things that I didn't mention here, but will become public, public information here in the, in the near future is, uh, is I, I, we've already made a video that kind of really explains all about beam brush and the technology behind it and the tech of it. Uh, and so what it was, it works with FB4. And so FB4 has a dedicated output just for beam brush. And so FB4 has and has always had uh, the XY outputs plus six color channel outputs plus the beam brush output. This has existed all the time. I remember when I used to come to Photon Lexicon meetings and you guys would rib me because I said, hey, we got this thing coming out. It's going to be this network controller FB4. And, the, and you guys would say, well, this other guy already developed it FB4. And I said, and I would kind of laugh and you, you guys would laugh along with me. I never took offense with it. But, but the point was, that, yeah, sure. Okay. They made this simple little thing sort of like what I made in high school, but with a network connection. And FB4 I knew was going to be a lot more than that. And so now we're, we're really starting to see that FB4, it's a, it's a, it is a complete media controller. It does OSC, SACN, it does all this crap, 
and it's a network-based laser controller, and, and it has all the stuff that was built into the future. I don't have one here, but if you pick up an FB4, you'll see there's connectors all around it, and we only documented these, right? So there's these connectors which do these other things, these connectors. So, so it's really, we, we wanted to make something future-proof. That's why it took us a while to come out with FB4. But now that we have it, you're starting to see some of the benefits. It's had beam brush capability all along, and so now we're just we're just finally uh, be able, being able to to bring this out and say, say this is where you connect it and this is what you do with it. So that's that's the situation. It's got to be FB4. So FB3 won't work. QM2000 won't work. Buffalo, you're out of luck. Sorry, man. Let's see. Hey, Bill, I got a question for you. Sure. So a couple of Salims ago, you had brought some of the Saturn stuff um, to to kind of show and tell. And there, there was a version you said of, of a Saturn that you could have that turned 360 degrees. Yeah. Have you found any application for that yet? Is there... uh, a customer called me just yesterday and <laughs> wants to move a diffraction grating uh, 180 degrees real fast and, and, and wants to do funny things within 180 degree uh, range. But so if that turns out, then that's going to be the first real application. The, the, what we did there was that it was just more of a show of technical prowess. Right? Mm -hmm. Can you do this thing? Can you make a motor that goes as fast as a scanner? And at first I said, no, that's impossible. And then came up with a way to do it. And then a half a year later, come up with a way to make it 50% better. So, um, so yeah, it was mostly a show of technical prowess and it's still a product in search of a application uh, up until this point. Although the conversation we had Friday has the best shot, I think of uh, a being out application. It's a small wheel to one inch diameter wheel grading that he wants to do something special with it. And, uh, you know, so so we have a high promise that that's going to actually work out. That's 180 degrees versus a 360 degree. Well, the motor will go 360 degrees. It'll go continuous rotation up on ScannerMax.com. One of the menu items and products you'll see uh, it says uh, uh, fastest motor in the world? Question mark. Um, so we, you know, just in case there's something faster. I mean, this it, <laughs> thing goes from zero to 120,000 RPM in one millisecond. Sounds pretty damn fast to me. But mm -hmm. there may be somebody else that's come up with something faster. So I'm not going to say it's the fastest. I'm going to ask the question: Is this the fastest? So, uh, so yeah, it's up there. Uh, you can see it up there. You can, it, there's a video up there that shows it doing partial moves, complete moves, rotation, counterclockwise point to point, continuous rotation, clockwise, counterclockwise, whatever you want to do, it'll do it and, it'll do, and it does it real fast. Awesome. Is there any kind of a comparison chart between say, for example, a Unity 1.7 watt versus a Club Max 8, uh, 1800? I, I'm that not aware that both there roughly is. the same project. I mean, it's like, so how much stripped down is the unity compared to the eight, you know, club Mac? Yeah. So um, my guess, and again, my, my, my area of the company is in uh, mostly new product development and right, laser, I realize that. laser systems is not really my area of the company. And so the only information I can give you is kind of what I've heard and what I've kind of gleaned through osmosis. And what I think is the Club Max 1800 has uh, an FB4 in it, and the uh, these these other ones mostly don't. They're mostly ILDA projectors. Okay. Uh, so it is mostly a it's a simple. It's like the difference between a Lexus and a, a Toyota. Some some Toyotas are really nice, um, and um, you know not quite as nice as a Lexus though. So so that's I, I think that's really the the. Um, kind of the comparison right there. But I'm not sure about a table. Um, Justin would be the one to ask okay. you about that. All right, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks. Brad, if you go to the website, you can at least look at them. That's what I figured. I, th I just hadn't had a chance to take a look and at he, it yet. He, he does have prices on the website. Yeah, so um, yeah, just just to kind of throw a couple things out there, Peter, John, and David have been just a real pleasure to work with on this thing. Uh, you know, I consider them partners in the process, uh, what they've been able to do. I'm really excited. I, 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 I'm Photon Lexicon, I said it, and, I, and I'll say it again. I, I'm not sure who's more excited about David having this thing, me or him, because I, I, I really want to see what he's going to be do doing with it. That tiger thing that we saw was just amazing. Uh, and so it's going to be very interesting to see what David comes up with, because uh, uh, what we've been using, this is it. This is all we've had to use for 45 years. It's been a Sharpie. So imagine if Picasso and Rembrandt and Andy Warhol and every artist you ever had, 
the only tool that they ever had was a Sharpie. Just imagine that world. Now, we'd still have the wide variety of art we had, and the guy who paints your house, by the way. Um, we still have the wide variety of art, but, it, you know, it's all just a Sharpie, right? So now we have something more than a Sharpie to work with. Um, so it's, it's really fantastic, and it's going to be just great to see what it is that people use this thing for and, and how they do this. And it's been great to see that, uh, that we've developed tools that are strong enough and powerful enough that you know, within four days that Peter Jean can spin that show and within two days, uh, uh, La uh, Dream Laser can take their existing show and, and put beam brush through, throughout. And uh, these shows that you've seen uh, that, that we, we've done, these beam shows with Lyra have been done pretty quickly too. So um, yeah, so what we've got here is not, not only something that looks great and is powerful, but is also pretty easy to use. I don't, I don't think you can understate how important uh, being able to diverge the beam like this is for certainly for graphics and even from beam shows perspective. I mean, you look at the difference that variable focus did for moving heads. I mean, they're, they're a critical element in any high end moving head at this point, um, you know, to add soft effects for concert lighting and so forth. Uh, it's, it's, it really is a whole new dimension. Um, in my perspective, uh, you know, for for the laserist. Yeah. And you also fill out that void that you normally get with laser graphics. Like, for example, eyes look like just like a circle. It can look pretty empty. Uh, not sure if my mic is clear, by the way, but uh, I feel like we haven't even touched anything yet from Beambrush. I think this is like the first start of it, getting the feeling of it, how it works. Uh, but I think there's so much to get out of this, honestly. Yeah, and I, I was, uh, Peter John posted that thing on Photon Lex, kind of what he did with Sophie. is 100% live. And uh, I'll tell you what, to me, the, 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 the hallmark of a great tool, great product is when even the creator can't figure out how, you know, how this stuff was done. So what, when watching this stuff that Peter John did with Sophie, I'm like, how the heck did he even do that stuff? So, so that was really neat stuff. So, so like I say, what, what I really like is to see how people use the tools. So, um, so that's been just really fantastic. Yeah, that thing has been overhauled. That's actually why I'm in London for that. It's actually the beam brush that brought me here. Uh, so I actually have one unit on my desk right now. Um, but I feel like, yeah, there's, there's so much potential in this and the tools are still developing. So we're not even there yet when it comes to tools. Uh, but, but it's really cool because it adds more depth to it. Like, you, you, have you seen some shows where certain colors seem to like be on top of the other? Uh, but now that beam brush, it, it, the, the width and the focus, it not only up, up, ups, uh, it only lets, lets you uh, you know transition between focus to to do a scene change, but you can also make a difference between what's the background layer and what's your foreground layer. Where normally you'd have to mask it out and cut stuff away to make room for what is the foreground, what's the background. So I think that's a really powerful effect. You know, and and to this point, you've only been talking about its uses in graphic shows, right? But uh, and when Bill Bill had been talking about Beambrush all the way back to the very first Florida meets, you know, 2006, 2007. And, and, you know, I'd seen a couple of pictures from the Laserist magazine from probably generation two, maybe Bill of Beambrush. There was a photograph with a cigarette and the smoke was. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, really, you know, really and I thought, oh yeah, that's great for beam shows. Uh, but, you know, when I saw Mike Dunn's abstract show, I was like, holy crap. It, it, I never even thought that it would be applicable to abstracts and it would look good in an abstract show. And then Lyra's uh, beam show just, you know, like you said, you know, brought care into tears. I, I just, it never even occurred to me to use beam brush in a beam show because why do you want to, I mean, what possible use could it be in a beam show? And, you know, I, I, I think I speak for everybody that, you know, Lyra has basically schooled us all on that mm -hmm. show because it's a whole, it's a whole nother ball game. So, yeah, I mean, you know, people are still figuring out how to use it. I never would have thought that beam brush would have been of any use to a beam show. Actually, uh, that was first thought that I had when I saw it was, ooh, this is going to make some really fun looking beams. Yeah, um, I, I never thought it would look as good as it did, but holy shit. <laughs> yeah, that looks amazing. I love the way that it looks. Yeah, that's, that, honestly, that's, that's one of the coolest things I have seen in a long freaking time. So yeah, it's, people are still figuring out uses for the tool and, and that's a sure sign of a useful tool, so. Well, great. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but I've, um, you know, I'm, 
happy to uh, happy to continue to sit here and answer questions and talk about my experiences working with the various artists. But I, I definitely want to be mindful of uh, of the schedule. You, uh, you to uh, definitely continue to answer questions if there are any. Um, X Leader is going to go at 4 p.m. So if we stop by 3:45, that'll give everybody a 15 minute break to stretch their legs and get ready for X Laser's presentation. Does that sound good? Yeah, yeah. sounds great. I vote that we send Ryan over to Justin's house to Shanghai his ass so he can get up here and start talking about deals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Ryan's in his office right now. He just walked by me and, um, yep. So that's where he is. I see him. Yeah. Yeah. We can see him on the, he's got his thing up. Hi Ryan. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah. This good yeah. timing. Cause my group Man. in the ballroom is just leaving. I got to go to Woken in, in a little bit. It's been a pleasure well, I, uh, seeing you all and hearing uh, Bill Benner and Oh, is it over? Yeah, hi, Mike. Virtually. Um, people are still asking questions uh, to uh, Bill, but um, I think the main part of his presentation is pretty much over. Um, you know, if you want to go ahead and take a break, you can do that too, uh, Dave Crumpola. <laughs> well, I'm uh, leaving in an hour to go to Woke, so... Well, uh, we're going to have another presentation starting uh, at four um, uh, by X Laser. Probably won't make that. I don't know. We're on uh, Christmas stuff already. Yippee. Mm -hmm. I unloaded 3,500 Christmas uh, related items last night by myself. Oh, it sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. I'm going to run, uh, are, run they, for now as well. I still have a pile of bliss lights. Those, uh, <laughs> those ones oh, that they, yeah. Long time no see. To see so well, many familiar faces, too. I mean, it's been a long while. Well, well, Peter, actually, while we've got you here, uh, I think, you know, you, you could, uh, you, hmm. you've got probably, I think, definitely more experience with Beanbrush in terms of laser graphics than anybody else yeah. at this point. You've got one. You did the show, and you've done this little graphic here with it. Oh, ten so, things, um, so what? What else can you say about your experience working with it? Your, um, you know, you were able to get it into your projector, I think, more quickly mm. than uh, David was able to do in his projector. But Obviously, David was really yeah. starting from scratch, and you started right. from an existing projector, just like Correct. we did. So, um, uh, yeah, any any kind of things that you could be talking about it, both from the uh, kind of me the mechanical and, and, and also the use in the software and the tools that we have, that'd be great. Sure, yeah, so so first, you know, getting that uh, beam brush, I was super eager to put it in there. It took me an entire day because I kept adjusting it, getting it getting it perfect. Uh, but obviously my, my unit's a retrofit. So if you see some graphics, I, I try not to go too white with the beam brush because when a retrofit, the color red tends to split into two separate lines. Um, uh, but but from a software perspective, obviously the first versions, uh, there was some timing issues, obviously, with, with the beam brush and the scanners, which has already been solved. It's it's now what you see on the screen is what you're going to get. Um, but I'm, I'm surprised how well they, they handle, you know, the optimizations that people that I that I tend to do. Uh, and, and, and there's definitely a fine line about uh, balancing beam brush uh, with some graphics because it, when you expand a line, it also, uh, even though you're, you're, you're spreading out that energy of the laser beam, you're also kind of uh, exacerbating parts of the light. So it actually looks like it's brighter sometimes when you expand a laser beam. So it can actually also add, just like you putting more highlights on, on a character or something like that, the beam brush also can actually uh, be uh, as a tool to, uh, to kind of show where the light's coming <laughs> from. So uh, I, I think from graphics, it, it adds a lot of expressivity. And I, on these graphics, these ones were just me messing around, obviously. Um, but, but you can really like make something feel more alive. So something feel, you can add more expression to your graphics, I feel. Uh, but you can also f really make like a difference what's, what's in the distance and what's up close by, uh, by expanding that, that line. For example, I went my graphics show. I had some trouble figuring out: Do I want to make things up close, the line thinner, or do I want to make it bigger? Um, and and eventually, uh, with my graphics show, it kept alternating all the time. Uh, but I felt like uh, things being bigger up close actually is better because it 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 looks it looks more present when it's up close, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> can I borrow your projector? Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so. I, 
you know, it's, it's just really fun to play with. And I feel like I, I haven't, I haven't even really found out yet what style to lock in with the beam brush. Uh, uh, obviously I'm working on a workspace right now for beam brush because content is key. I think we can all agree on that one. Uh, and also a content that helps inspire people to how to use it properly because, you know, for them, they might actually know uh, what would look good or what makes sense in a, in a show. And, and, and by giving something to people, you narrow it down and make it easier for other people to create something cool with beam brush. Not to, uh, can you hear me? Not to interrupt. Oh, hey, um, but I'm going to be, I'm working on four pages of graph of beams for beam brush. Mm -hmm. That'll be stock content. Um, so there'll be four extra pages of that. I, and so we're obviously going to have some graphic and abstract content in there as well. So there should be at least six pages of new content. So I'm working on eight pages this right now, but uh, all right, well I, then I'm there's going to be even more. That. Yeah. So, <laughs> so don't... my idea for the workspace was to add, uh, you know, because a lot of people use stock frames as well to build shows, which is all right. So I'm actually adding some background things, uh, some, some overlays with beam brush, because obviously you want that dimensionality like that, you know, that what's, what's in the front, what's in the back. Uh, so people have these assets where they can, you know, take a simple graphic or a logo and pop a beam brush environment on the back or something, you know, giving people some tools to work with, not just something that's the end product. Um, and, and, and I think that's, kind of cool, I guess. Uh, we'll have to see, obviously, how, how, how I will grow that workspace as I go. Um, uh, PJ or Lyra, I'm not sure who is best. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Beambrush will currently run just fine under Beyond 4.0, but 5.0 just adds extra content, basically basically a new, new workspace. Uh, or the way that it is split up is there's actually, in terms of development, there's two trees of Beyond right now. Um, there is 4.0 old license system, which is being worked on. And there's also 5.0 with new license system and Beambrush. There is not anything about Beambrush in the 4.0 um, development uh, timeline. Okay. So if you do get one, your hands always early, we'll set you up with the new um, builds. It's, a, it's not in the 1300 range. It's actually in the 1400 range. Um, so it's completely kind of offshoot. Alexei is keeping them separate for now because the licensing system mainly. Um, but if you do get your hands on it, then we will we'll set you up with that. So with but, the, so, so, but just to be clear, so Beambrush is going to be a 5.0 exclusive feature. Uh, yes. And so if you do get it in the meantime, it's going to be on that version. Yeah, even though the, um, the title bar, it, it's, it doesn't say 5.0. It's just because we haven't changed that, that thing yet. Uh, the, the license system is you know, kind of the biggest change there and the addition of beam brushing. But there is quite a bit, you know, there's quite a bit of difference between the beyond with beam brush and a previous version. Just like say, we've, we've worked beam brush really throughout the whole, the whole program. And I also want to just make sure that people know the license, the new license system is more of a technical change than an actual uh, change on what your license means for you. Um, so don't, uh, I, I, it can easy to be afraid like, oh, you're going to turn into Adobe and do, you know, uh, but no, that's not how it's going to I think, I think it's safe to say that we're already well aware that Bill would never turn yeah, exactly. beyond so, into Adobe. <laughs> we are, um, it is very much based on, uh, we, it's just more functionality and it's easier. Um, and also it is, it is better for, uh, piracy. So, I mean, for being yeah. honest, so. And also with theft, I mean, just a lot of things that uh can happen when when you're on a show someone could you know right. get some stuff so and, we can um it, it'll be easier for those sorts of things it'll be and it'll give people more options so exactly um, but it, it's the only reason is because we don't because the licensing system is different and in progress um it is there's that's why that there's a development offshoot in the meantime for that um so that people who are using the regular old system right now in the 1300 range of builds don't uh, get caught up in that development. So, yeah. Here's a question for uh, Lyra or Bill. Uh, I noticed that in 4.0, I believe, or, or in some build of 4.0, the option to uh, export a timeline as, dot, uh, as ILDA frames disappeared. Is that a piracy thing? Is that a temporary thing? Is that a feature that is ever going to return? Just out of curiosity? Well, I'd be amazed if you ever found an option to export ILDA frames. Uh, we haven't supported the ILDA file format and beyond, you know, um, to, to my recollection, maybe ever. ever. Um, but no, the option it? to export, uh, mm. you know, the, the option... um, 
I know what it is. It's the, the LDS format is gone out of beyond in favor of QSB frames. Oh, it was not. You're right. It was not. Um, it was that, is the, yeah, that is okay. the change. Uh, right. so why QSB was. frames? Okay. Uh, the QSB frame is a lot better for both um, for beyond reasons, for security reasons. It has much better increased security as far as I know, according to Alexei. And also it is going to be able to, it's just Alexei made the change to kind of not ditch LDS. You can still bring LDS files in, but because of frame security mainly, um, we now are just doing QSB frames. Probably. Yeah, so I, I think what you're referring, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you think you're right. Sorry, that was that was entirely my bad. <laughs> there was never ILDA frames in there. It was LDS. You're right. <laughs> yeah. So so LDS, you know, uh, the the Laser Show Designer 2000 series was released November of 1999, right? So more than 20 years ago. Um, so the, in the file formats that were developed for that uh, were developed 20 years ago and and never really expanded, and yet um, here we have a, a new situation where we have new data, new additional things like, for example, the, uh, although um, Beambrush was conceived in the LD2000 series, it was never really implemented throughout. And so the, you know, what I'm saying is that there's, there's always new things that we're adding to the frames. There's always new information, new additional things to improve the scanning quality and that sort of thing. And, and as we're inventing new things, we can add them into new file formats. Also the old file formats, you know, uh, as, as good of a job that I did in, in uh, LD2000, I'm, I'm actually not a classically trained programmer. I, I went to school for electronics and when I went to school, they taught us just enough programming to demonstrate that the hardware we developed worked to the software guys to say, okay, here's how you do it software guys. Now you software guys figure everything else out, right? So, so I'm not a classically trained programmer and yet I uh, kind of independently implemented my own compilers implementing independently implemented my own a way of doing object oriented programming and everything else. So I developed a lot, but there were certain things that I that, that were developed in a very fixed manner. And today we have new ideas like what's called model controller view. And we have the, the, the way that the file formats are done now is called TLV tag length value. And they weren't done that way when, you know, when, when I was implementing this. So, so the, the, the files that I made for the LG 2000 series were very rigid. I knew they were rigid. And so I put additional, where I felt we would probably go, I, I put additional hooks and stuff in there to, to go there one day. But we're thinking of things these days that I never even dreamed of back in the year 2000. So, uh, so that's the point is that we, we want to be able to continue to move forward. We don't want to be restricted from moving forward because we got to be compatible with this thing I came up with 20 years ago. Right? So that's the situation. Thanks. Sorry about that. My misconception there, but total, that logic totally makes sense as yeah. well. Hey, uh, Bill and or Ryan. Uh, Ryan, you 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 both talked about uh, uh, the, the fact that the licensing is partly in, in regard to piracy. Ryan, you recently posted on PL uh, about this company uh, GagaLight.com, um, and they're still posting. Um, I can't find anything about them being a dealer for you guys either. Uh, they're in China. I'm just wondering if these are one of those companies that are selling the counterfeit FB3s perhaps? Yeah, I came aware of this on Friday. I talked to, I think mean, Justin wasn't in, so I talked to the people that were in and asked, hey, have we ever even heard of these people? They said no. It could be they're buying them through someone, but it doesn't make any sense with what they're charging for and what we sell them for. I mean, they're they're, they'd be collecting scraps. So I don't know, uh, especially once you factor in shipping in Texas or tariff coming into China. So my guess is I don't want to, you know, knock off, knock the company and say it's definitely counterfeit, but it's probably counterfeit. I don't know how they'd be making any money after they pay for shipping and, and import fees for what they're selling them for. Knowing what we sell the FB3 to China for. Yeah, plus, if, if they get called out on it, you know, what, what these companies usually do, they, they just change their company name. It doesn't matter to them. So they just keep changing names and names and names until you get sick and tired of them. So if you don't know, it's, if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. So, yeah, you got to – I wouldn't go for it myself. No, no, no. That was my whole point. That was, I was trying to kind of the, – the, the fact that they're, they're still posting even after Ryan kind of gave them the gentle smackdown. Uh, I was just wondering if you guys were going to pursue any further action 
Oh, we, we, well, we definitely will. I, I was not aware of this. And so we have an attorney who we have aggressively pursued and successfully pursued uh, counterfeit operations. And, um, and so we've been very successful at that. So as soon as I get some information on that, we'll turn them over to our attorney who has offices in San Francisco and also Shanghai. And ah. so, um, you know, we, we will, we will, I, I appreciate the heads up on that. Here's the, uh, here's the link to the thread. The guy who was asking for the FB3s, I, I made him a deal on those anyway. So he's, uh, he'll get a known original ones for better than what he get them from China. So. Yeah, I was going to say my last one from you guys direct was cheaper than that China price. So. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're wheeling and dealing and making deals. It's not just, you know, what's on the websites, what's on the website for website and, you know, marketing purposes. You need something, pick up the phone, money under Pangolin and call and say, Hey, I'm doing this and I need an FB3 and you have any B stock? What's the best deal you can make on an original one? Can you make me a bundle with some scanners? And we're, we're wheeling and dealing. We get what's going on with everyone out there and we want everyone to be able to keep building and designing and creating rather than just the world freezing for however just long. So speaking of um, Chinese call or email me or email Justin, we're wheeling and dealing, making deals for everyone. Uh, so they we keep things rolling here and also for you guys. Speaking of Chinese counterfeits, Opt Laser out of China, I noticed maybe four months ago when they were reselling the yellows, had on one of their listings a Pangolin logo on um, on Alibaba. Let me see if it's still there. I think OPT gets um, stuff from Mimi, but I, I'm not a thousand percent sure. They have also stolen my shows and posted them like they were theirs. So. Yeah, because there's um, two OPT lasers, one in China and one in someone in Europe. Yeah, I mean, I mean the one in China. Sorry, let me make yeah. sure I specify. I don't think they get the point of artist credit. And maybe they slept the logo on there because they just put a, net, a project with an FP4 in there and they're like, oh, slept the logo on, there we go. So there's no yeah. real regards with quality when it comes to these companies and their advertising. They just want to sell, bottom line. Yep. So Lyra, since we do have some additional time, it would be great to hear your perspective on creating things in BeamBrush and uh, the ideas there, how it can be used and just all that we've heard from Peter and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what, how can I, how else can I say other than the, uh, Bill, you were there the first night I played with it. I was, I was screaming, excited about it. I mean, it was ridiculous like it's it is and i don't want to say that i hit a wall with programming but i was definitely like well i'll program what i need to i wasn't very i wasn't necessarily inspired to like push the envelope and really do it because i had done the large projector count thing i had done the small projector count thing i had done this that and the other thing but this is just it's just brand new it's completely brand new i feel like i am it's the beginning of my career again um and you know the, the show that um, you guys saw in Bill's presentation was the first Beam show that was ever written with Beambrush, and it just is like it is it is yes, I, every time I you know touch an effect that is in there, I'm like it, it used to think of stuff like oh this is I wish I could do that, but I can't. You know there's that, but there's also like. I never knew I could think of that. That's a completely new novel idea that I've never heard before, never had seen before or come up with. And it is just completely, it is beautiful. It's so much fun. Um, and it is completely renewed lasers in general for me in a, in a sense that is just like, I, 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 there's, there's a certain number of passion projects that I have down uh, the line in the pipe that I want to work on, which I haven't had for years. So, it's, it's really, really huge. And I just, I just love it. And it's not just like, also things like from a practical standpoint for being on, um, you know, when you do touring and when that comes back, um, like for crowd scanning applications, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like, okay, I can set, I don't have to have the uh, projector being entirely at a certain divergence. I can actually, you know, lower the divergence as it gets farther away to the audience and make the show a lot cleaner and crisper for everybody. And also while maintaining safety and also doing this, that, and the other thing. And it's just, so you, I mean, and also like, uh, 
I was making, I spent last week, I, I did some looks of in beyond in the workspace. That's just like lighting looks. They're not even, don't even look like they're really coming from a laser other than the sparkle. And that kind of thing is just, it's ridiculous. Cause you, you know, as Bill had said in his presentation that, you know, beam, uh, laser, lighting have always tried to be more like a laser. They're trying to have a smaller beam, brighter beam. They're trying to move either, or they're, they're trying to move it fast and it's not good enough. But you know what, if we go after them, ours is way better at pretending to be a light than a light is at pretending to be a laser. So you can add these kind of super soft, super um, lighting style looks um, just inside of using a laser it's, and also have the sharp and have it maybe both at the same time from one source. It's just ridiculous and I, and I love it a lot. Um, so it's, I, I can't do anything but gush about it. So I might as well stop. And maybe if there's questions specifically about um, the beam show you applications and I can answer those. Uh, well, Lara, you mentioned, you mentioned audience scanning uh, and maybe Bill, you may want to comment. What's the, the, potential legal climate for for integrating beam brush with pass such that you no longer require the safety scan lens so yeah. there is no uh, bill if you want but i do know that there is no actual specifications on specifications on how you achieve that uh divergence it is just kind of the the lens is part of is how you achieve the divergence so we can use the beam brush in the same way to achieve the divergence and there is more stuff that we plan on doing to help make sure that it is reliable enough um, so that we're kind of ahead of the regulations, which is- Yeah, the, 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 very, the very quick answer is that um, we've actually already gotten uh, reg approval to do this. Um, so cool. okay. projectors can already be sold and delivered to do, beam, uh, to do uh, audience scanning with beam brush uh, without uh, safety scan lens. So um, we've all literally already got that approval. We, we will be- in, in, increasing it and, and beefing up the uh, safety even further than it is right now, but it is, um, you know, it really kicks ass. So, because, and, and the thing is, is that beam brush has a, it's the scanner's position signal. Um, and we, we can actually get a redundant signal off of what we call the boomerang. And Adam, you know what that is. And other people will, will get to learn about that soon as we release the video. Um, but uh, we can get an additional position signal, redundant position signal off the boomerang and, um, to, to really assure safety and add that into pass. And so that's something that we are going to be doing, but even absent that, it's actually, we've already gotten approval to do this, so. Excellent, excellent. That, that's, that's actually got an advantage over BAM because I mean, by the time you get to, you know, I safe levels at BAM, you end up with a beam you can barely see. Whereas with beam brush, I mean, you get a thicker beam and as long as the light in it is dispersed properly, um, yeah, you could get, it, it, you could make it look quite bright comparatively. Well, there, the other we've built in a brush attenuation map already. So um, the other, the other cool thing, and this is kind of the, the, the progressive widening of the beam as you go from no correction to eye safe correction in the audience, now is basically an infinitely variable path. Uh, and and it, it tends to to uh, blend the effect to where you don't notice that the beams are, you know, largely diverged, you know, in, at the low part of the horizon where the audience is. Um, that was the whole point behind the progressive lenses that you know Bill and was it Jeremy right? Bill that was yes, in the UK right. was working on those. Yeah. Yeah. So, we and we we couldn't get it to work. The, the the people that make those lenses, you know, at first they were they were really excited. And, and but when we kept going back to them and said, "Can you adjust this?" Can you? At first, they were like, "Oh man, we're really excited. We'll, we'll do anything for you." And by the third time, we went back to them and said, "Can you adjust that?" They got sick of us. So yeah, we yeah. we 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 basically never really w was able to achieve what we wanted to achieve with the lenses, but we can do it with beam brush. You're right about that. Yeah, yeah. And there's also no distortion when when you put a lens down. You get this shifted image and, and and you know with the cross section off the lens, you know the beam is scraping past that. So there is definitely a break. In, in, in where there's no lens and there is a lens where the beam brush, you don't have this. It's just transitions right into that diverge. Not to mention you don't need the three axis adjustable mount on the front of your projector to hold the lens in the first place. Yeah, or, yeah. or figure out that the lens is set too low and you have to go all the way up there to fix it. That's the worst thing ever, right? If you give me one second, I can kind of show you it actually working. I just have to find the photo. Yeah, sure, sure.
Yeah, actually, what I can do is I can show you something here. Uh, I could share my screen, hopefully. Um, I'll share this thing. Uh, this thing or this thing? Maybe this thing. Um, so can you see this? Yep. It's a part of a video that we will be releasing. It's existed for quite some time, but uh, but this shows you that we can we have this this new beam brush thing that we can do with a BAM. We call it a BAM brush right now. But this next slide here compares the difference between a safety scan lens and what you could do with beam brush. Yeah. That's and exactly, and yeah. in addition to that, now here's something that you can't do with safety scan lens. So so we tested beam brush at its maximum divergence that we have here, which again, we could push further, but we have here and it took us, we, we have a safety scan lenses up to eight diopters in the, um, in, in our, um, you know, in, in our uh, repertoire, you know, that we offer. And, and I had to put two of those in series to get to the level of divergence that we can with beam brush. Mm -hmm. So we can get up to 16 diopter uh, divergence with, um, you know, with no, none of this stuff that you see here in the middle of, you know, this kind of dual line thing that we, that we can with safety sand lenses. And, and it was another thing too, we, we have a customer who, um, uh, who, who wanted to, um, we had a customer who wanted to uh, mount a projector at an angle and have the safety scan lens still be horizontal. And we don't have a mount that does that. So we'll have to, we, we will have to, for that customer, we'll have to make a mount that does that. But what we've got is, um, you know, with beam brush, you can do this li literally anywhere, and it will go anywhere. instantly. It, it, you know, and I'm not sure if David has tried this or not, but literally, in, in my in my beam brush workspace, I have I have lines that go from here to, to, to from from minimum divergence to maximum, and it will do that. And so, um, point to point, yeah, yeah it yeah. will do that. Yeah, I mean, it, Bill, you didn't spend a lot of time talking about the upgrades you've made and beyond, other than to say. Uh, you know that beam brush, beam brush has been incorporated in a lot of the creative aspects, you know, throughout the program. But one of the secret sauces um, uh, that's coming and beyond is a whole bunch of tuning things. Uh, you know, for example, so as as the beam diverges, you know, unless unless you you've got your incoming beam into beam brush placed absolutely perfectly, which I don't think you know it, it is actually possible as as beam brush comes into play basically you end up with some shifting back and forth before correction but bill's got a, a cool tool and beyond where you know it dynamically adjusts as you go through uh the variations of of beam brush so those kind of those kind of tools are are um a really cool and interesting addition too it just makes it automatic so that what you do, it's, it's, a, it's the old wig, WYSIWYG thing. It's what you see is what you get. What you see on the computer screen is what you get out. Uh, what Mike Dunn was able to do and Peter Jean and Dream Laser was entirely done on the computer screen. And then they sent us the stuff. And when I showed it to Mike, one of the things I did was I had my iPhone and I, uh, I, and I had uh, the, co the corner of my computer screen and the rest of it was the projection surface. And the point was to show the corner of my computer screen, which was the preview window, to show the preview window and the projection surface and they looked exactly the same. So, uh, so we've got it that good so that it looks on the computer like what it's really gonna do in real life. Yep. I have some questions about beam brush. Um, maybe I didn't catch it, but is there a limitation on the scan speeds? Is it 30K? Can you, can you do 30K PPS or even 60? Yeah, so the, uh, the beam brush, it's a mechanical device. It uses a scanner. It's a very fast scanner, but nevertheless a scanner, and it's moving a, a relatively high inertial load. And so I, I tune the performance of the beam brush for 30K, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't use 60K scanners with it. In fact, uh, both Peter John has our Saturn one that they usually run at 60K. Peter John can run at 90K if he wanted to. Uh, David Kumpula has our Saturn ones, which he usually uses at 60K. He run at 90K if he wants to. And the, the software we have, that one of the things that David mentioned, uh, and it's not something that we're really going to be putting out there a lot because that's not something I want people to pay attention to or, or worry about. The software figures out what needs to be done to make to, to keep Beambrush in synchronization with the graphics to, to accomplish what it is that you're trying to do, no matter what your actual scan speed is. So, and, and this is understood in the time domain. The software understands this stuff in the time domain. The motion is done in the time domain. And so it could be synchronized in the time domain. And it's by a computer. It's one of the things that 
really frustrates me. It's like, yo, look, you're the computer. You could be able to figure it out. I'm just the human. You, you're the computer. You figured it out. So, so we have written the software in such a way the computer figures it out, right? You just, you just put your input is the artistic vectors and stuff like that. The computer figures out what it's going to take to get that artistic input on, uh, as, as Ivan Dreyer used to call it, on, uh, through the machine and onto the screen, right? That's what we want. We want to take your art and get it through the machine and onto the screen. And that's what we do in, in our software. So, be, so because of that, it actually doesn't matter how fast it is. It's our problem how fast it is. It's the software's problem how fast it is. So that's the story. Uh, just a reminder, um, if you want to take a break before X Leisure starts, this is the time to do it. Yeah. Uh, just for everybody, if you want to keep asking questions for another 15 minutes, you can, but this is your chance to stretch your legs. Great. And Lyra, if you've got some more words of wisdom, that would be great. There's, there's actually literally nobody on earth that has more experience, actual real artistic experience using uh, Beanbrush than you have. So that would be great to impart your knowledge on these willing uh, ears we have here. Well, uh, well when, you, when you eventually get to play with it, um, because whether it's you have a projector or not, you have the software, step back. Take your brain, step back. Um, and think, don't think, you got to not think uh, like you used to. Um, I, I started and I was having a lot of troubles with coming up with stuff that just didn't, that looked good and didn't look s silly, I think was the thing was like, I was like, well, this seems kind of cheesy. There's got to be more cooler actual ways to use this. Um, and so once you do actually get your hands on it and whether it's software or hardware as well, um, just really take a step back and think about it. Um, don't use any preconceived notions about what a laser projector is and can be um, because you will discover a lot more from the get-go if you, if you do that. Um, and I would also pull inspiration from other less lasers, but um, more lighting designs and stuff too because you know we now get to do this kind of uh, size and shape and it is something that uh, is a is a is a really cool thing um, and contrasts between sharp and softs you, another thing that I realized when I was doing this is like you kind of almost forget if you have a lot of beam brush going on you forget how sharp the laser actually gets and so you can kind of tease it in a way that's like lots of big lots of big and then bring it right into a sharp and it's something special because it reminds you of how actually small those beams are and how tight it actually can be if you just, you know, tease an audience with a bunch of fat beams and then sharp it hits and it's, there's, there's a lot of um, art to that and a lot of things, there's a lot of things that I think are going to be um, really, really artistic, at least for beam shows, it's, you know, it's harder for me to make comment on graphics or abstracts, but um, I know you've heard from PJ, so it is going to be really, really special. And I'm, I hope for a, like a lot of people, they have a similar visceral response that I did of like, wow, this is genuinely going to be something brand new and genuinely going to be inspire me to do more work and do more art and genuinely inspire me to create shows again, if you kind of fallen off or anything like that. Yeah. And the fact that no foundations have been set yet, it, it opens up a whole creative thing. Like there's no right or wrong. Like you'll f figure out what works, what doesn't work. And, and the industry will school itself about what's, what's the way should, things should be done. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's really exciting. I, I think it's really encouraging as well to see some development on the graphic side of things where we, we get some more control than we, we didn't have before. You know, sure, we can do a lot with graphics, but at some point you hit this barrier where you feel like, I wish I could do this or I wish I could do that or I wish I could enhance this depth effect. And, and a beam brush just gives you an extra layer. Um, and, and, and even from a, like a real time or installation thing, you, for example, if you would use Touch Designer, you could, you could put because beyond streams, you could put it on a, on a zone. You could put the Z depth effect uh, that where you touch designer, if it's in Z data, you could use that. Um, and of course the rendering plugins are still changing where you can set a width for every object maybe, or you can do a Z render where you just put an effect in beyond over that enhances the Z depth width and everything. So uh, yeah, really exciting. 
Yeah, I'd like to double click on something that Lyra said. So I remember when we first got to the one, just one projector work and I was in the same room with Lyra, we started to play around with effects. And it was, it was interesting because the thought process was like this. We were sitting side by side and said, oh, you know what I bet would look good? This thing. And we put it together and, and it wouldn't really look that good. And then we powwow a little bit and you know, you know, I, I bet this other thing wouldn't look as good and we put it together and it, it would look pretty good. You know, so it's funny. <laughs> some of the things that you wouldn't think look good look really amazing. And some of the things you'd think, oh, this is going to be so cool. And you put it out there and it's like, eh, it's something, but it's not quite what I had in mind. So it really is. It's just a tool that's going to require a lot of exploration. And um, it's great to have these different things, you know, these different, the different folks involved. That take like a cool example of that is um, I thought I would need like to use a circle to make a blotch of color and then beam brush it. But I don't, I just need a point. I don't, and I can, it's big enough that I can make a nice splotch of, um, of light without using circles. I can use an individual point and it's a much fast, it's much more efficient. Or things like, I thought like, you know, having a, you know, the, norm, the very classic, you know, wave, liquid sky wave. I thought maybe adding it to there would be cool, but it was kind of harder to see. Um, but what you do notice is like, you know how clear the swirls are, you get actually volumetric clouds instead of just this razor sharp cut through. So that is another thing I was exploring, like how can we, you know, use that to our advantage to kind of help define, help define the, these changes in divergence. Um, so there's a lot to it and power effects and beam brush together give lots of magic that um, Definitely, 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 yeah. you're gonna wanna. Definitely, and it's also bringing the Z fr uh, depth frames back. You know, at one point people said, ah, oh, the Z axis uh, in ILDA files and stuff like that, and it, it's always all disappearing because it, it's, it usually used to be an inconvenience where Beanbridge now encourages it to come back. So it's kind of interesting to uh, do some Z depth experiments quite a lot now uh, to see what works in scanning because obviously Z depth is like a wireframe situation where you kind of don't always wanna show everything, so you lose efficiency. Um, yeah, that's all my comments on that, I think. And I, I don't want to uh, do a little, too much of a sales plug or anything, but we will be doing a webinar in a couple weeks um, on timeline stuff in general, a bit of art, a bit of technical, um, and I will be using the beam brush projectors there and showing them off there. So once we announce when that actually happens, um, if you're really getting into this, really interested, then that is a time to take a look and um, see more. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be great to watch that um, that timeline thing because John Tilp used to say, and 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 I later learned that somebody else uh, it was the one who actually started it. I, and I'm not able, not able to nail the actual attribution of this, but it's a saying I love, which is, talking about art is like dancing about architecture. You know, um, we can talk all all we want, and it's still not going to come across. You actually have to see it with your own eyes to to really appreciate um, you know, what's, what's being done. I'm glad that we were able to watch these four shows today and that um, I encourage everybody to uh, attend and watch uh, Lyra's uh, timeline presentation because uh, the fact that Beanbrush is gonna be a part of that, and I, I, ju I just learned that now, um, the fact that Beanbrush is gonna be a part of that is just really gonna make that uh, very valuable for people to, uh, to really understand what it, what it is and how, and how it can be used and what, and what it does. Thank you, Bill, for coming and sharing your time with us, for sure. I know that I appreciated hearing everything that you all had to say. Um, and thank you for putting together that presentation for us, for sure. Uh, there's some really exciting things going on here. Great. I think that uh, the attendance shows that uh, everybody was interested. So, um, yeah, thank you so very much. Um,